All right. So, my name is Jimmy Zell. Currently, I'm a UX lab analyst at Epic Games, and I'm here to present a stare and a collaborative mixed reality dance game for co-located players. So, just some background first. In recent years, the popularity of and interest in VR has grown once again. Uh, fueled by VR technologies with increased sensing and actuating capabilities and more affordable prices. In 2017, 9.6 million people used VR sets, headsets at least once a month, and it's anticipated by the end of 2019, 19.6 million people will have used VR headsets at least once a month. Along this growth, VR experiences have diversified, stretching across multiple applications, domains, including but not limited to realistic simulations, training and learning, data visualization, and obviously, entertainment. This has meant an increase in social VR, too. VR chat made this growth especially noticeable with its surge in popularity a year ago. However, even with the increased usage of VR for network social purposes, VR as a concept is still too isolating. We chose to take advantage of a tendency to hijack its senses of the players for a mixed reality project that instead utilized the physical space around the player, the mixed reality game. So a few notable mixed reality experiences include Dollhouse VR, using different perspectives to tackle architecture scale issues, Haptic Turk VR for its use in physicality to simulate flight in VR, and Share VR for its asymmetrical and interdependent elements. Asymmetric gameplay in this context means play operating in the same game space but working with different specifications, which might be abilities, rules, or roles. In our own work, we focus on technology-supported play and the inclusion of those within the play space, including spectators. We wanted the game to only be partially supported by tech, along with limited rules in order to encourage a richer social and physical experience. We drew inspiration from two commercial VR games. Audio Shield was used as inspiration because of its easy to grasp concept and its focus on dance and music, which provided the back and forth relationship between the players we wanted to capture. We focused on the asymmetrical and interdependent nature of Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes VR, Using these aspects as the foundations of our game, we began to prototype a stair. Through rapid iterative design, embodied ideation methods, and body storming, we began to envision and test several core mechanics, the design resources of the mixed space, and potential social affordances. We came up with a stair, a dancing mixed reality game with two players, VR in and VR out. We designed it so that both players had different points of struggle to contend with or relying on each other to work towards the end goal of a higher collective score. It was designed so that VR in could focus on the micro level movements, how the limbs should stretch and move, and VR out could fo focus on the macro translational movements, specifically where to be in the room. We purposely kept the atmosphere silly and light through our two themes, line dancing and the can-can to reduce the awkwardness of physical social, public physical social contact and dancing. VRN wears the headset and has a, either has a controller tied to the wrist or left holding it, whichever is more comfortable to the player. They saw the virtual world and everything within the 3D space through a limited field of view, around 90 degrees, including the taggable objects and obstacles flying towards them. Their personal objective was to tag as many musical notes using the controllers. VR Out has the controller strapped to their ankle instead and sees the world through a top-down view from a screen that would, allow, that would show the taggable objects. It also showed these objects appearing a second before they actually did within VR In's view as well so they could prepare to tag it by making their way there. However, the viewpoint is limited in that they don't know where specifically the note is, just the general area. They are responsible for tagging the glowing spheres. So we focused on two aspects to dig deeper into creating more social affordances for our players. Alternative controllers and the design resources of technology supported play. We did both through simply attaching the controllers to players' legs and arms to direct focus onto their partners and their own movements. The HTC Vive controllers were used to support the play rather than become a focus of it and should have been considered as extensions of their limbs. These were the main social affordances we wanted to target. To encourage social touch and the focus on the intrakinosphere, 
we introduced the game rule that straying too far from each other would re result in point deductions. The different and limited perspectives, as well as the ridiculous atmosphere, encourage players to hold on to each other, having their play spaces intertwined and convey information through verbal and physical means. VR ins and VR outs unusual dynamics stem from our focus on interdependent play and collaborative asymmetrical gameplay. We wanted two roles with different abilities and viewpoints working together towards individual goals to achieve a larger, cohesive goal. While they needed to touch the individual targets, the overall objective was to grab as many of both to work towards a higher goal while remaining in close contact. Spectatorship was a culmination of all of the above. We relied on the fact that including all of the previous aspects into a co-located dancing game would result in a chaotic and silly back and forth that would drag viewers into its tempo and atmosphere. Once we were satisfied with Astaire's design, we playtested it alongside two games that inspired it, Keep Talking, Nobody Explodes, and Audio Shield. We aimed to observe and compare the spectator and player experience through which we use the, utilize the self-assessment mannequin, Sam, for, as well as their effects on interpersonal relationships, which we use the inclusion of other in self, iOS, for as well. For Sam, we only use the scales for pleasure happy to unhappy, and arousal, bored to excited, as they were the most pertinent to the study. In particular, we studied if and, any, if and how any of those games supported an enjoyable play experience for players and spectators, and whether they supported developing the interpersonal relationship between spectators and players and players and players. We recruited 15 people, split into groups of three consisting of VR out, VR in, and spectator, with each person remaining in the same role across all three games. However, due to Audio Shield being a single player experience, VR Out became a spectator for that segment. We followed a within subject playtest protocol, randomizing the order in, in which each group played each game. Players were given the iOS survey before playing any of the games, and given the iOS and SAM surveys after each game as well. Data from on site notes and the interviews were analyzed qualitatively bottom up, coding interesting emerging topics, which are later grouped thematically. The videos were used to contextualize information that users provided, and the survey data were used to support the qualitative data. Scores for Astaire were higher across all three measurements of excitement, enjoyment, and interpersonal relationships, and for all three roles. For Astaire, spectators also seemingly enjoyed the game the most out of all three roles, consistently noting down higher scores. Because Audio Shield is a single player game, VR out players acted as spectators during that round, which is why VR in players have no iOS scores. There was no person to serve as a reference point. So our analysis, analysis revealed three themes represented by just a few of the quotes above. Physicality, social play, and balance. So for physicality, one player mentioned that it felt awkward and silly, kind of like if you were at your first winter formal, which is a traditional high school dance in the United States. Players related to the close proximity, social touch, and nonverbal communication that the game encouraged, which was a strong factor in the higher scores. For social play, one player mentioned, it was really funny when you guys were late in grabbing that one point and you were trying to rush left while I was screaming for you to get the one right and VRN got really confused. Players particularly enjoyed the richness of embodied interactions, referring to several game design elements beyond the technology that supported their experience. Players also appreciated that they had equal responses and abilities in the game, so that felt like a constantly shifting dynamic. One person mentioned that it, if it was more like dancing, like I was controlling myself with the other person serving more as a resistance for that movement, and then instructing the other on what to do. So we discussed two design takeaways in the paper, but I'll only talk about one of them here. VR out was central to the overall experience. VR out players anchored the VR in players to the physical realm, while at the same time elevating their virtual experience with meaningful tactile input. Leveraging touch was very relevant for several reasons. First, touch is a less predominant sense for VR in players compared to sight and sound. Then it provided VR out players with a plane to operate on to differentiate their roles in a meaningful manner. While we were expectant of how VR out affected VR in, we were surprised by the importance and impact of VR out players for the spectator experience. We reason that this is because VR out acted as an important bridge between VR in and the spectators. VR out could share in the reactions with spectators and have noticeably more interactions with viewers than VR in could. They could also react towards VR in's actions and express that in a way that spectators could understand. So, like I mentioned before, this is just one of them, and I would encourage you to read the paper for further elaboration. 
with that, are there any questions? Wow, great. <laughs> Thank you. So are there any questions from the audience? We have a student volunteer running around with a mic. So let's put it on. So please so raise your hand if you have a question. Yes, there's one in the middle. So please say your name and your affiliation. And then your question, of course. Hello, that's a great talk, really interesting. My name is Sarah Wiseman from Goldsmiths University in London, in the UK. Um, I find the concept of social touch in games super fascinating, and you briefly touched on it here. I have two questions about that. Hmm? One, the participants here, did, were they known to each other beforehand? Like, what, were their, what was their familiarity before they took part in the game? And two, you said you encourage social touch by deducting points if they separated, is that, is that correct? And did yes. you think of any positive ways to encourage social touch uh, like games such as Bot Party Manage, and there are other games out there that positively reward social touch rather than negatively disciplining you for not doing it. Uh, so alongside this, I'm going to answer the second one first. Sure. Uh, alongside the point deduction, it was because they couldn't communicate effectively with each other just using verbal cues. So like because one person see, is seeing everything in a 3D space, just telling someone who doesn't see that space, like, oh, it's over there. It doesn't communicate well enough. Whereas both, pers both people can like, move each other's limbs because they're holding onto each other's arms and bodies and sway them in a way that puts, positions them right. And then when they say over there, it becomes like, kind of following their already implied actions through the body. And what was your first question again? Did they know each other before? Oh, some of them did. Uh, only, one, only one pair did for the players themselves. Mm. Okay. We have other questions? Perhaps I had another one when I was reading your paper. I, I was wondering in, to what extent elegant movement is promoted by the game. Is that awarded? <laughs> or do you promote silly movements? What, what, was uh, before, what, what, what were you hoping to achieve? I mean, I designed this game slightly with the intention of watching people fall because okay. it would be yeah. funnier. <laughs> Awkward <laughs> movements. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, I mean, we, I did line dancing first to encourage like a like ease them in, say like, oh, it's really slow, it's easy, you go back and forth. And I threw them into the can-can and then made objects start flying at them. So they had to <laughs> dodge and like kick their feet up and high in the air. Like when I first made it, I made the point too high for like the people for VR out with the control attached to their leg. I made it like heads up. So people were like kicking really high up and falling. And I was like, nice. okay, <laughs> I should tone that section down a bit. But yeah, I went for more of a ridiculous atmosphere. So like everyone could join in. Because if it's like graceful, elegant, it's kind of, it doesn't exclude the spectators, but it's easier for spectators to join if everyone's like communicating and laughing about the same thing and mm. acting as if it's a party game. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on. Of course.